Hello, welcome to this presentation on value, the quest for the good. This parallels the information you'll find in your textbook, Discovering Right and Wrong by Mr. Louis Poyman and James Pfizer. Let's talk a little bit about the term value. That term value comes from the Latin word valere, meaning to be of worth. I'm sure that uh, you have found many things of value in your life. And what we're about ready to discuss here is how to categorize the various kinds of values that you might discover. This idea comes largely from Plato's Republic, and that has to do with the idea of purely intrinsic goods versus purely instrumental goods, or combination packages of both those goods. Now, it might seem a little bit odd to discuss things such as the good, but think about it from the point of view of what you already regard as something of value that doesn't require any justification on your part with respect to trying to answer the question, why do you like that? I find certain kinds of things in life intrinsically valuable, such as, for example, uh, trees, forests, roses, blossoms. Uh, to some extent, I suppose I find certain items of furniture of value. I find my dogs of intrinsic value. That is to say, I believe that they're intrinsically good. And from my point of view, they would be, quote unquote, good whether or not I or any other conscious, sentient human being were around to be able to evaluate them. You, of course, may have a slightly different view on that. An intrinsic good is something essentially, again, which is just good in and of itself. An instrumental good is something that's good for the sake of the attainment of something else, pure and simple. We'll go into somewhat more detail as our semester progresses with respect to that notion. A hammer is good for hammering nails. It might not be perceived to be intrinsically good, I suppose, unless perhaps it might have become an antique and of value, but still it would seem to have more instrumental value insofar as it is worth a certain amount of money. So a person might possess a, an antique hammer, let's say, for the sake of making some money, in which case the hammer becomes instrumentally good. Now, it is possible for someone to treat animals like dogs as instrumentally good because they're making money off of the breeding and sales of such creatures. That's true. Some things, of course, we can regard in a subjective way as intrinsic and in a subjective way as instrumental because we're saying that intrinsically for us they are good. But what uh, Ar um, Plato and Aristotle seem to be suggesting is there's something out there in, in nature that's just intrinsically good. Of course, this conversation becomes really relevant when we're talking about certain forms of environmental ethics, such as biocentrism or preservationism. And we will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the current environmental ethics theories again toward the end of the semester. Let's get a little bit of a soundbite from Socrates. Tell me. Do you think there is a kind of good which we welcome not because we desire its consequences, but for its own sake, joy, for example, and all the harmless pleasures which have no further consequences beyond the joy which one finds in them? Now, you might recognize that uh, dialogue that uh, stems from uh, a wonderful discussion that uh, Socrates has with Glaucon. This is out of the Republic. And it's also referenced in your book in somewhat greater detail. Uh, the idea, of course, is to try to convince uh, Glaucon, from Socrates' point of view, that there may well be such a good that requires no further justification and that can be regarded, therefore, as not instrumental, but as intrinsic. So what things are good? The idea of hedonism is a doctrine that holds that pleasure is good, that pleasure is the only thing that's good in itself and that all other goodness is derived from this value. Hedone, a nice word from the Greek, which means pleasure. As you know, we use a lot of Greek and Latin words in a somewhat technical sense, almost jargonistically at times, I'm sure, in philosophy and ethics, uh, to try to capture or to try to identify specific concepts. Hedone literally means, out of the Greek, sweet, and pleasure is often associated with that which is sweet. So it makes perfectly good sense to use a word like hedonism uh, to try to identify this particular notion, namely that all pleasure is good. Now, remember, certain kinds of pleasure uh, 
may not necessarily be bodily pleasure, such as what you get from eating or sexual encounters or perhaps even exercise or certain kinds of physical activity. It could um, also refer to, as we later learn, the pleasures of the intellect, of the mind, perhaps of contemplation, of study, things that might seem less bodily and to some extent more abstract. So we don't want to uh, foreclose on the prospects of opening the horizon, so to speak, to other forms of hedonistic stimulus, if you will. There are essentially two types of uh, hedonists. They're the sensualists, and these are persons who equate all pleasure with sensual titillation. And the sensualist is the type of individual who, in all likelihood, would um, consent, on a good day at least, to um, some form of electrochemical stimulation, perhaps electrodes that might be applied to certain areas of the brain, the pleasure centers, and uh, thus might be the kind of individual who'd hook his or herself up to a machine in order to achieve sensual titillation. A slightly more abstract, and I would say um, holistic, maybe more comprehensive view, is that of the satisfactionist. A satisfactionist could be called a person who equates or identifies pleasure with the satisfaction or enjoyment of certain activities. And these activities may not necessarily involve what we call sensual titillation. Example might be uh, engaging in certain kinds of hobbies, which uh, I think many of us would agree can be regarded as having intrinsic value. Uh, I'm an amateur radio operator. I find it intrinsically valuable. Does it give me some joy or pleasure, I suppose, in some sense of the word, by participating in it? Or, let us say, uh, for some of you, model railroading, or perhaps model building, uh, perhaps uh, engaging in the construction and flying of remote-controlled helicopters and uh, other small planes and devices that uh, you yourself have built, constructed, and operate. You get a certain amount of satisfaction, but it's not necessarily what you'd call uh, some form of uh, chemically induced or electronically induced titillation. So you can kind of see that uh, these two camps naturally suggest themselves when you're talking about the study of pleasure. Let's see what Aristippus says. He's referenced in your text. The art of life lies in taking pleasures as they pass, and the keenest pleasures are not intellectual, nor are they always moral. And of course, when you hear somebody that's talking like that, you do get the distinct impression that they are suggesting that if it's true that pleasure is the prime directive, so to speak, that human beings ought to be pursuing, then it may be that, uh, at least under some uh, definitions or characterizations that the activities that you or somebody else uh, are engaging in uh, might be regarded as immoral, either conventionally or from an objectivist point of view, but the implication would be that still you ought to be pursuing them. So there is an ethic there. One ought to be pursuing that which gives one pleasure. The question is, are you focusing more on sensual titillation or maybe on the satisfactionist paradigm? By contrast, non-hedonists uh, can be categorized in this fashion. Generally, we divide them into the, the two following groups. Uh, group one, monists. Group two, pluralists. You can probably tell by simply looking at the word monist that uh, these people, those that, that represent this particular kind of thinking, believe that there is a single intrinsic value. However, it's not pleasure. So uh, a monist would say that there is something out there uh, it could be something that is religious, religiously inspired. It could be something that's somewhat more material. Uh, but uh, whatever it is, it's going to uh, make your day, so to speak. It is intrinsically valuable, but it's not pleasure itself. By contrast, a pluralist, it multiply monism several times over and you have a pluralist, regards the, uh, the notion that pleasure is uh, an intrinsic good as uh, a, if you will, positive characterization uh, or denominator of the idea, but there are also other intrinsic goods as well. So monists believe that uh, there might be something out there. could be nature, for example. could be something that's a, an important environmental ethic. could be the universe itself. Couldn't it, in fact, I suppose, be God. It's something that's intrinsically valuable and it's worth pursuing. However, it is not pleasure. 
Now remember, when, when, when somebody uh, talks about the pursuit of pleasure, they're not necessarily telling you exactly that which is going to give you pleasure. They're simply saying that whatever it is that a person engages in, if it in fact does give them pleasure and that pleasure is intrinsically valuable and worth pursuing, then whatever it is that, that provides that uh, opportunity is that which ought to be pursued. Could be a thing, could be an activity, presumably could be uh, another person, who knows. The question about values, valuing, valuing, valere, are they objective or are they subjective or are they a combo package, package of both? Sometimes we do express these things in a kind of dichotomous, false dichotomy fashion, either or, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, have to be the case that you need to be on one side of the fence or another, but when we polarize the uh, questions this way, sometimes uh, in determining what the archetypal responses are, we can kind of see where we might fall in between the extremes. On the objectivist view, values are worthy of desire, whether or not anyone actually desires them. Values exist independently. Now, where might you see that? You know, it's, it's a good idea to try to draw a mental picture or do a thought experiment of some sort in order to try to figure out what might be meant by something like this. Uh, if somebody's me making this kind of a comment, what they're in essence saying is that whatever it is that is valuable out there, let's say intrinsically, is intrinsically valuable whether or not uh, a human being or another sentient, rational, let us say, conscious, self-conscious creature is around to appreciate it. So um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily require that there be a person or an individual, uh, as we have come to understand what it means to be human, that actually is evaluating something uh, for that uh, thing to exist. So if you can imagine a world, and some people have tried to provide us with certain kinds of thought experiments with respect to this idea, Imagine a world that uh, has never had a, a creature as complex as a human being in it, but pretty much has all the other uh, items, ecosystems, uh, denizens, uh, other sentient beings that might not be as sophisticated as human beings in some sense of that term, um, and consequently beings like dogs, cats, or whatever their equivalent would be on this uh, other world, uh, they just uh, behave as they would typically do anyway in the absence, however, of something like a human being. The question is, are these creatures not valuable? Are there things in this kind of a, a world or universe valuable, whether or not there's something around to evaluate those items or objects or beings? And uh, if your answer to that is yes, you're probably an objectivist. On the other hand, the subjectivist thinks that values are dependent upon the desirer, uh, which is sometimes a bit of a hard word to pronounce and are relative to the desires only. So that would mean that in order for there to be value, that there must be a valuing sentient entity that is uh, engaging in some sort of a aesthetic, if you will, practice, and thus confers value because of a relationship between the thing valued and the valuer on that thing. So uh, rocks, trees, forests, things that uh, I'm using that are uh, naturally, quote-unquote, occurring. Um, these things would be, on this view, only valuable if there were something to evaluate or value them or impute or impart value to them. And that value, of course, uh, could be either intrinsically or inherently uh, conceived or instrumentally conceived, although I suspect that on the subjectivist view, it would seem to be the case that there would be more of an instrumentality associated with the evaluation because at the very least you want to say this thing is of value to the human being insofar as the human being is able to derive something from it in a way of, let us say, pleasure or, some, or satisfaction. Otherwise, no value exists on the subjectivist view, the extreme sub subjectivist view. So what's the relation of value to morality? Value theory is uh, essentially at the heart of moral theory because we have uh, moral principles that are built up uh, around the idea that there are certain kinds of values that are out there either intrinsic or instrumental. Uh, your relationship to your wife, your daughter, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, um, that, that those relationships are probably perceived to be of, of, of value in and of themselves and also in, uh, under many interpretations of value to you. But because they're of value, we believe that we should develop certain modes of behave, behavior, certain 
modus operandi that uh, would allow us to be able to associate uh, with the things that we value uh, in conjunction with other people who are likewise making evaluations of their own. So we have these basic values. Friendship might be a case in point. How do you preserve friendship? Uh, well, you might uh, decide upon the development of certain kinds of principles or perhaps orchestrate a moral theory that preserves that notion of friendship or love or family. Many people regard family as having uh, the concept of family or the family itself as having intrinsic value. But indeed, it not only would seem on, on some reading to have intrinsic value, but also it would be valuable for the sake of your own survival, your well-being, the sense in which you derive satisfaction. But either, in either case, uh, we create institutions, and uh, they're both moral and legal, in order to try to promote and preserve the stability, let us say, of the family, because we recognize that a family and family relationships are of value. We then, in turn, uh, judge those principles that we can utilize in order to decide what we ought to do. And the book does talk about something called weakness of the will, in which uh, recognizing values, recognizing principles, we nevertheless are too morally weak to accomplish the task at hand. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Socrates himself, uh, ancient philosopher, lived uh, flourishing 2,400 years ago, mentor of Plato, um, had some things to say about the crisis that we uh, encounter when we're morally weak. We know that we should do the right thing. We know that we have certain principles that we should abide by. Uh, we know that there are certain values which we want to try to adhere to. But because of weakness of the will, we sometimes, quote unquote, do the wrong thing. We don't live up to our expectations or the expectations may be placed upon us by our family, our culture, our society, uh, the region to which we belong. A question, of course, that has to emerge from a discussion about values and also the principles that embody uh, value systems is the notion of what the good life is. Now, Aristotle succeeded in tying up moral behavior with what constituted the good life, at least in terms of his conceptualization of that. Aristotle lived uh, 384 to 322 before the current era. Uh, he was a pupil of Plato, Plato being a pupil of Socrates, and Aristotle picked up some things from both Socrates and Plato. And uh, I think it's safe to say that all three philosophers believe that people do seek happiness, the idea, of course, being that happiness is an end in and of itself, and that it is an inherently valuable thing to pursue. So whatever it is, by the way, that makes you happy, there could be a kind of relativity thesis surrounding the notion or conceptualization of happy or what it is that makes a human happy. We can all differ about what makes us happy, but the fact that we want to be happy is part of the human condition. It's almost a metaphysical statement about our nature. So it could be said that Aristotle is saying here that people seek because of their nature, happiness. And Aristotle would be the first to tell you that if you go around the world, even though there might be a relativity with respect to what makes a person happy, happiness itself or the pursuit thereof is a universal. And so that that would make this statement from Aristotle an objective statement about the human condition, not a subjective statement. Aristotle probably thinks you can just look around, observe this uh, uh, directly, and what you can't observe directly, you can probably make some appropriate logical inference about the fact that other human beings, sentient organisms, homo sapiens, seek happiness. My guess is that if that's true, that other primates do as well, and probably even your dog or your cat seek happiness. You can tell that while they're not consciously thinking about the pursuit of happiness, they are doing those things which eventuate neither happiness or pleasure or some, some important uh, variant characterization of those two things. Very important principle, odaimonia, or ia, odaimonia. Now, if you parse that word down, again, another one from uh, the Greek, uh, that word daimon uh, basically translates and transliterates to some extent into the English demon. And frequently in the English world, in Western civilization, when we talk about demons, we're thinking about something really negative, but that's certainly not what uh, Aristotle was thinking. He used it in a somewhat more technical sense, obviously, and the EU there, O, means well. Uh, this could mean good-spirited, where the term a demon actually means something like spirit or soul, good-souledness. But this gets translated, by the way, and probably uh, almost harmfully at times, as happiness or a sense of contentment, satisfaction. So if you want to go ahead and translate odaimonia as happiness, 
At the very least, we want to try to understand Aristotle as an objectivist, as asserting something about odaimonia such that it is not a subjective state, or it's not necessarily pleasure or the uh, experience thereof, but it refers to the overall life, the kind of life that we want to have if we truly understood who we really are. So the idea of understanding what our essential nature is has to do with uh, a metaphysical notion. Uh, metaphysics is the study, to some extent, of how things really are, the branch of philosophy. So how is a human being really constructed? Aristotle thinks he has an answer to that. A human being is constructed in order to seek happiness. So um, what a human being should do is spend a good deal of time trying to cultivate happiness. As we go on to see, however, it's not just simply what we talked about earlier, the happiness of titillation. To some extent, is the happy, happiness of satisfying certain kinds of uh, goals or uh, activities that a person pursues in life, but we will come to discover when we talk a little bit more about Greek or Arataic ethics that the life of the uh, odaimon, uh, the odaimoniac life, is constituted of virtue as well, living a virtuous life. So uh, you, you pursue to some extent the satisfaction of certain goals and ends and activities under Aristotle, but you also have to do it with the idea in mind that you should practice uh, virtue, have uh, developed an aptitude towards virtuous behavior, without which, he would argue, you cannot have an uh, odaimoniac life. It's a beautiful word, very harmonious, odaimonia. The challenge, of course, would be to come up with a really fitting uh, single English word uh, that actually captures what this Greek concept is, is directing our attention to, and that has been difficult, to say the least. And I say to you that odaimonia, the life of happiness and self-satisfaction, is not simply a subjective state of pleasure, but the kind of life that you would want to seek if only you understood yourself more fully. And there you have it, uh, roughly from the horse's mouth, from Aristotle. Thank you for joining me. Uh, this, of course, is supplementary to some other presentations that are provided through uh, my Philosophical Quest website and my YouTube presence to my online students. Thank you very much.